Thank you. Let's see if I can, let me invite Eric on stage here. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Eric. Welcome. Good. Welcome, Eric. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear fine. Super. Thank you. Yep. Welcome. We'll just uh, watch for Leon Toe here and uh, Rafael Frega. I think you may have seen my note. Um, had a little bit of an accident, uh, small medical problem, so he's not going to be able to make it. So it'll probably be wow. uh, uh, three panelists and myself. So we're going to be live in about oh, five minutes. Yeah. Let's see. You know what? I'll um, let me ping Leon, and uh, and then we might have to just get going. Okay, great. Well, um, you know, we are here uh, um, as one of quite a few panels that are happening at this hour. Actually, you know, in my sort of informal survey of the uh, of the of the uh, event, it appears to be more you know more sessions happening now than uh, than at any other time. So hopefully, some uh, friends from the Harasses community um, can join us. But as you know, this. Uh, this will be recorded and can be viewed by others um, after the fact as well. So given that it's, uh, I've got 3.48 Eastern time, I wonder if we might as well uh, just go ahead and get started, even with, um, you know, just the, just the three of us. What do you think? Sounds yeah, great. Great. Well, you know, just kind of uh, um, going down our list of panelists in alphabetical order here, Eric, uh, perhaps you'd like to start by uh, telling us a bit about yourself. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Buatois. I'm a partner at uh, BGV. And uh, basically, we, we are investing. Oh, you know. Uh, Hello, Leon. Welcome. Yeah, yeah welcome. You know, so thank I'm you. a partner at uh, Benamo Global Ventures. Uh, ben, sorry, Global Ventures. Sorry about that. Uh, a venture capital firm based in Silicon Valley, investing, investing cross border uh, with Israel, Europe, and India. We focus a lot on the next wave of uh, enterprise uh, investment, for industry for the auto, which is basically accelerated now post-COVID. Uh, investing at the early stage, seed, series A, we're taking a, a board seed and reposition and having enough capital to, uh, to follow our companies through their development. We play the long game. And uh, we've been doing this cross-border investment for, uh, for a long time. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Uh, just going down in alphabetical order, Mike, maybe you can tell us about yourself. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you uh, so much, Bill, for the opportunity and then to our friends at uh, Harassus. Um, so Mike Marotti, I actually uh, represent two uh, fund vehicles. One is a group called Cortado Ventures, which is based in, uh, in the Midwest, you know, focused on B2B tech, uh, in, including you know, healthcare, uh, IT, life sciences, and small uh, pre-seed to Series A fund that will cap out at about $2 million per company, t total of uh, $20 million under management for, for the current fund. And uh, the other is a group called R3 Bio, which is a regenerative medicine incubator uh, that is in, uh, predominantly in, in uh, Boston, you know, building new regenerative medicine companies out of uh, you know, the, uh, the ecosystem there. And in this case, um, you know, mostly company creation, uh, which would include cell therapy, gene therapy, tissue engineering, you know, anything that could... Um, it would be considered regenerative. We take a very, very broad definition and have, uh, well, uh, we're in the process of completing our, our initial raise of $100 million and are likely to be oversubscribed. So that's a quick overview of my, my vehicles. That's great, Mike. Thank you. And, uh, and finally, we have uh, Leon To. Leon, uh, if you could tell us about yourself. 
Uh, thank, thanks so much, Bill. And uh, good to be here. Um, big shout out to and thank you to um, Bryce for having us. Um, I'm Leon To, the chairman of Damson Group and the executive director of Damson Capital, which is our elite growth stage uh, investment arm of Damson Group. Uh, we look into, um, you know, our core belief really is about um, all about positive purpose uh, companies that can drive strong long term profit and can be used for as a force for good. And essentially that falls within the remit of uh, for many people as defined by ESG. Uh, we look at it more as impact investing um, and direct investing from that, that view. So we focus on social impact investments, enterprise development, impact innovation, all within Asia itself. And of course, um, our portfolio um, has included industries in green logistics, renewable energy, biotechnology, ethical and sustainable lifestyle brands, and even SME financing. Uh, so that's a little bit about us uh, in terms of you know coming through from that aspect. And I think what just characterizes us uniquely as impact investors is not just the uh, financial outcomes that we're looking from the market, but also you know delivering on the um, the social and environmental impacts that are very much attached uh, to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So really happy to be here and looking forward to a great conversation. Uh, calling from Singapore at 3.50 a.m. in the morning. Well, you know, I think you get extra extra points here, Leon, for uh, dialing in so late. And I got to say, you know, you got some good lighting there. I, I would have thought it's, uh, it looks like, you know, a nice uh, natural light, probably uh, mid-afternoon. <laughs> Although it's probably, probably not how you're feeling, but uh, yeah, yeah, look, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, brighter than I would at that hour, certainly. So thank you for uh, for being able to join us. Um, and then uh, another panelist, Rafael Fraga, um, something came up the last minute. He wasn't able to make it, make it. So we do have a, uh, a quorum here of uh, three panelists. I'm uh, I'm Bill Douglas, uh, Gotham Private Capital. Um, I raise funds for startups and funds. Um, pretty uh, industry agnostic, but it tends to lean toward healthcare and biotech. So uh, happy to be here as well and to be um, uh, enjoying this discussion with everyone. Yeah, let me just uh, um, kind of review the, the topic that we're here to discuss, managing venture capital in the post-COVID era. VCs must reevaluate their current portfolios as the nature of the stock market has changed during the COVID pandemic, given the vast cash injections made by many governments to support indigenous businesses. In which sectors are VCs starting to re-engage? Will there be a boom in new VC-backed startups? Um, are other models of startup financing more attractive to entrepreneurs and investors alike? You know, I, I wonder if um, if we can shift the uh, time perspective on one of these questions. You know, will there be a boom in new VC-backed startups? Um, I almost feel like uh, you know we're 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 already there. Um, anyone anyone care to comment on that? Yeah, I can get started. Yes, definitely, at least for me. <laughs> I feel we're well, definitely there since uh, last August, September. And uh, being an investor, very focused in the technology for the enterprise. Uh, uh, COVID has accelerated the consumption of technology by large company by at least three years. A lot of large mm -hmm. companies were nervous about migrating everything to the cloud. But when they had to put uh, some of them 100,000 plus employees working from home, equipping them with new notebook, and tablet, and so forth. And they saw the workload in the cloud working, as well as they were able to protect, uh, uh, from a security standpoint, the whole environment. So we felt that uh, the top management, a lot of enterprise, got confidence in the technology, and therefore, the, 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 the obviously, the investment follow-up. And at the same time, I think the message of uh, being respectful of the planet has crossed through. So usually... Uh, ESG investing, at least in the technology space, in venture capital, was maybe not the top of the mind. Definitely a number of investments we see happening in uh, using technology to uh, to be very uh, careful of the environment uh, as we really increase. There is less uh, inhibition to invest in this type of plan. That's interesting, Eric. So um, ESG has risen more to the, the forefront as a result of COVID. Um, uh, Leon, I, I understand you're, uh, uh, you know, it, immersed in that area to some degree. Maybe you'd have some uh, some comment. 
Uh, I think so. Although, you know, I think it's, it's natural for me to also, you know, converge and, and you know, develop a lens for Asia and the investing here. And I think the, the opportunities of uh, ESG and impact investing really come through uh, very, very um, uh, well in Asia because, you know, we've actually started realizing how uh, people are getting receptive to the idea on the basis that the pandemic has really struck uh, Asia uh, hard. It's done really well over the first few weeks, but in actuality has come back to a position where that we're actually suffering a lot. And the long-term suffering from, say, uh, the pandemic has actually shown that the, the way and the speed of uh, getting out of the pandemic, especially for Asia, will be very dependent on the lowest common denominator getting support for COVID. Uh, coming out of it. And those mm-hmm. are your rural second tier, third tier cities that actually have are, are suffering with COVID itself. So on the basis of that, um, there's this dual speed um, of um, recovery that you see in, you know, um, certain parts of developed Asia versus, you know, developing Asia. And I think as a function of that, we are starting to see great case studies of digital health um, access and startup around Asia that actually um, had an issue overcoming certain barriers of adoption before, not just from the level of connectivity, but also from a, a level of, you know, um, a practice culture and also a reliance on it, especially in a time where everything stopped. I think actually what the pandemic is going to allow us to do is actually um, really re, uh, change the speed of adoption of digital tools from Asia in different parts of Asia. And at the same time, you know, develop the right, especially now where people are going back from de- the developed cities into rural areas, that we're going to start seeing a lot of this technology and um, because of the disruptions, a lot more people adopting it. So two words come out um, from this period, adoption and access. And I think we're going to see a lot of people Mm -hmm. go back into their previous playbooks, their previous portfolio companies, who they thought had, you know, a lot of challenges on that front to be implemented, actually come back to the fold again as great opportunities uh, for investing. So I'm going to stop right there, but I think those are two um, key words for me coming out this period. Yep, yep. Adoption and access. Um, Mike, do you want to, do you have any any comment there or, or maybe getting a little bit back to the, um, original question, you know, in terms of a boom and new new VC new boom and new VC backed startups, uh, maybe in your area of life sciences or uh, or, or otherwise. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to comment. So I, I saw that there was a um, a white paper released by the Kaufman Foundation, which is one of the uh, foremost entrepreneurial think tanks in the world, and it basically showed that the uh, rate of company creation is the highest that it's been in 25 years. And of course, part of that is just you know, people uh, leaving uh, you know, larger entities, people getting laid off from a, a variety of industries, and uh, just people rethinking their priorities after a profound uh, crisis. So, you know, I, I would say that without exception, you know, this is the single best time to be starting a new company or, or even uh, an entrepreneurial venture within a larger organization, just because so much has been disrupted in the past 18 months. And to to your question, just I, I've also seen you know record fundraising from the the venture capital set. So availability cap of capital is quite good, uh, even for um, you know, those groups that historically have had difficulty accessing capital. There's a number of you know, specific funds available for um, you know, minority-led uh, companies. Uh, noting that I'm half Hispanic myself, uh, for for women-led companies, I've seen. Just an incredible amount of, of specialization you know, for these niche funds. That um, uh, you know, thinking about at least from from my from my own industry, that of life sciences, it, it's uh, it may be one of the the, the few uh, you know, silver linings on the pandemic. Just the fact that you know our our industry to to some extent you know, is helping countries emerge from uh, the crisis. So, of course, that is drawing a lot of uh, great interest from the family office crowd, from the institutional investor crowd, and really just drawing a lot of activity into the sector, uh, because I would say there's a pretty good chance that this will not be the last pandemic we face within our lifetimes. Uh, So, yeah, it's it's been maybe one of the few uh, bright spots uh, after this whole mess. Yeah, and, you know, when I hear about, you know, the Kaufman uh, study of, you know, highest rate of company creation in 25 years, the first thing I think of is, 
Well, you know, that, that, that's probably true, but I wonder if it's a lot of, uh, sort of garage, uh, startups, uh, you know, these, these, uh, um, uh, anecdotes you hear about and, and, and read about of, uh, you know, people who have been laid off and they, they go ahead and come up with a, uh, you know, a small, um, uh, uh, business venture. Uh, but it sounds like you're saying, you know, in, in your, uh, in your experience, it's actually, you know, these are actual, um, uh, these are ventures that are really, you know, scalable and or uh, and securing venture funding, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, higher level uh, operations or at least with potential to be so. That's correct, at least within the life sciences. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, any other uh, any other thoughts on that topic? No, from other panelists? Yeah, I would say on the technology uh, enterprise side, we see obviously uh, that this company have legs because when you see the the size of the gross round, you know, uh, gross round of TPP, the series T or D, are really increasing with company achieving scales, especially company using the SaaS business model. Mm -hmm. The SaaS business model is very sticky. And when these companies are in the growth acceleration phase, which really demonstrate they can be uh, some strong player, you can see a lot of this company scaling, which is very, very interesting. And the good news is company come all over the world. You know, if you take an RPA, UI pass, who was born out of Romania, the success of EDYN in payment out of Holland, uh, Brazil in terms of fintech. So the good news is that this scaling of a very strong startup is starting to happen all, all over the place. Yeah, all, all over the place. And Eric, you you have an interesting uh, perspective because you have such um, a geographic diversity in, in the areas where your uh, where your firm invests. Um, are any of those areas um, kind of uh, you know uh, booming more noticeably than uh, than others, and are others uh, in your in your orbit lagging behind? Yeah, I would say what we see absolutely uh, booming is the use of uh, artificial intelligence to create new solutions by vertical industry. Silicon Valley is well known to invite, to sort of to invent horizontal technology. So, of course, there are a lot of play. But when you see the use of artificial intelligence, we have some very smart company with some domain knowledge, deep industry expertise, are uh, exploiting the data existing within the company to create new solutions, new workflow, mainly helping uh, the human, keeping the human in the loop. The innovation is all over the place. You know, we are... Uh, we have just made a recent investment in a company uh, in France, pricing enough, being very innovating in using AI for the insurance industry, not for back office automation, but more for the frontline workers. India, using satellite image and so forth uh, to, with AI to manage uh, the remote plant of large utility companies like uh, electricity and water. Given the fire season happening in US, you would have expected a company like that to pop up in US, but it pop up on India. Why? I don't know. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> and interesting enough, we syndicated this deal with National Grid, which is a very large UK utility. So what I like is that this innovation now cutting across all kinds of industry, uh, give again the ball back to industry experts, wherever they are located, to create new applications. And some of them are not necessarily in Silicon Valley, which is much better at core technology, at least for the B2B space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So another, another question in the, um, in the descriptor, um, are other models of startup financing more attractive to entrepreneurs and investors alike? Uh, you know, Mike mentioned how uh, observed that uh, there's more, um, seems to be more venture backing for minority and, and female helmed uh, startups. But I think this this question is hinting at, um, you know, are there other models of fin startup financing uh, uh, outside of uh, venture? Um, in other words, I guess maybe have, has there been some uh, lateral thinking or some innovation in uh, financing models or approaches to financing for startups that have kind of uh, sprung out of or, or uh, you know, found uh, more, more, uh, more attention um, during post-COVID? Anyone? Yeah, you know, I, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think you know, in general, um, you know, venture capital is not right for for every company. So, in fact, I actively discourage uh, you know a, a lot of entrepreneurs from seeking venture money, particularly early on when there's still questions around product market fit, um, and at least trying to to solve kind of the early. Um, 
uh, challenges because uh, just it, it's it's really too uh, expensive. The, the money is very very expensive in general, and, and people that at least have, have been around venture funds know that you know, the we have our own limited partners to to keep happy. So there's certain expectations around when you can sell an entity. So I think the short answer is I've also seen you know a number of people just getting creative with receivables based financing. You know, trying to bootstrap uh, companies as best they can. You know, finding suppliers and, and seeking at least uh, lines of credit or other types of non-dilutive funding, uh, in some cases, very, very successfully uh, without having to take on any dilution. So um, mm-hmm. the people that are capable of, of at least, uh, you know, structuring those deals, I, I, I would say um, in many ways, that's better than having a bunch of people looking over your shoulder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think for us uh, in, in Asia, we're seeing two, two elements, right? I think one is, um, you know, alternative um, liquidity uh, in, uh, instruments or even offerings and clauses within traditional structures. So uh, one was, you know, the more flexible payment structures, longer horizon views, but also more, I think, um, uh, debt instruments also on the market, uh, especially for early stage uh, companies. And that's been quite interesting because obviously it's a recognition around uh, a lot of um, the need of entrepreneurs looking for liquidity in a very, very crunch time. And at the same time, uh, alternative uh, structures of, of um, liquidity, uh, which then also helps reduce the dilution elements. But the one thing I just wanted to recognize was also um, the, um, the next wave for proliferation of um uh, early stage venture studios, for example, where there is a, a larger kind of support mechanism that's actually being provided um, to entrepreneurs, especially at the time of, you know, and I, I really liked, um, you know, what uh, Mike and, and Bill, both of you were saying with the whole idea of more garage startups coming out of coming up necessity or coming up, uh, you know, innovation of opportunity at the time where everyone's stuck at home. And I think that these small supportive spaces and structures are actually also providing uh, interesting um, places for them to actually start their journeys as well, because it's um, giving them a lot more um, scaffolding to start with. Uh, so I think we're, we're seeing uh, some movement in that uh, space and um, that opportunity of unpre- unprecedented, you know, uh, situation. People saying, "Well, what's the worst could happen? Let's give this a shot." Right. Mm-hmm. So I think quite interesting elements there. I'm aware of at least one very large uh, sovereign wealth fund that took a pretty thorough look at its entire portfolio within venture and determined that the venture studio model was producing you know, by far the best returns on a you know, multiple on capital basis uh, of really any strategy. It was all you know fund one, fund two, fund three. Uh, that were structured around some, you know, university or some niche technology sector, uh, and I guess the the point being, they, they tend to become their own uh, momentum, right? Once you get enough companies in one sector or geography uh, thinking around the same terms, there's a lot of cross pollination that occurs with regards to learning, and of course, they can be really, really helpful for first or second time entrepreneurs. You know, looking to to disrupt an industry to be around that kind of talent. So I'm a huge fan of that model as well. Thanks, Mike. So you know, here uh, here in the states, um, at least in in many parts of the states, certainly here in New England, it's starting to feel pretty uh, post post pandemic. You know, um, you go to there are there are many fewer signs about wearing masks. Up. Uh, people are starting to have gatherings, etc. Uh, but, you know, it's easy to kind of take that for granted and uh, lose sight of the fact that it's not that way um, in a variety of different places, uh, certainly including parts of, uh, of Asia, as Leon had alluded to, um, certainly in, uh, in India, where I have a lot of relatives on my wife's side of the family. Um, the, the virus continues to, to, to rage in a pretty strong way, and it's come back in places that you wouldn't have expected it to, um, such as Japan and, uh, and Singapore, where, where Leon is. And, uh, Leon, I just wondered if you might want to comment a bit more about how, um, how that, uh, apparent cyclicality, um, if you will, uh, may have affected the, uh, maybe affecting, you know, uh, uh, venture strategy and, uh, and, and, and long-term thinking in, uh, Singapore and, 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 and Asia more broadly. Yeah. Oh, that, that's a, 
That's a that's a tough question, but an interesting question. I think um, I can't speak for everyone, but maybe uh, you know a, a view that we're we're looking at in Singapore is that we're moving from a view of a world in a pandemic to a world where we're actually being stuck in what we call an endemic. And mm -hmm. the, the essence is, you know, we're asking a question: What does the world look like as COVID continues or continue to uh, to uh, you know as a let's say stronger form itself continues to evolve as well. So a lot of our strategic planning and questions that we're looking at at home and within us at Damson itself is, you know, what does that look like? How is it not just showing an implication for today in the next six to eight months, not just in disruptions to supply chain or stopping of the borders or movement of people, but more importantly as well, right? Um, a question around um, how does this uh, look for, um, uh, startups who are more digitally native, how does that actually look like for adoption in places like Indonesia, especially for early stage companies? Is this suddenly becoming the more right time for people to start going in? As you know, Eric mentioned before, you know, the um, uh, when it came to, I think, um, especially in Asia itself, where you have a lot of entrenched um, you know, corporations uh, involved in brick and mortar elements that are part of the question of whether disruption can take place. And I think now is the time where they're starting to realize that they have no choice but to take place. And I think they're mm -hmm. opening up the realms and also opening up the minds of people to start saying, we need to get this moving. And similar to kind of the swinging 20s, we will be seeing a lot more technological adoption and for a change in mindset and also movement uh, towards that um, a re-energized kind of techno technological adoption. So it's not that we've never had it, but I think it's going to push a lot more of the population into this fold. And I think that means a lot of the business case studies that we thought were smaller, actually are much larger as we expected. The one thing that I think we, we just haven't really talked about enough is how the pandemic or the endemic is going to really start changing consumer perspectives. And I think that that's also really interesting because we're starting to ask questions around, okay, there must be a lasting change that is going to look, uh, that will affect anyone who's gone through COVID. And I think for Asia especially, we're going to, I think, um, right, and rightly so, but, you know, I think um, uh, Mike mentioned as well, you know, what does that look like, um, especially if we're going to see more and more of these types of COVID situations? And I think Asia is very interesting because we've had to deal with SARS, but flu um, and COVID and over the years, all these different pandemics, uh, well, similar situations, probably not at the same scale, but similar in that sense. And mm -hmm. I think it will continue to um, you know, build into and burn, you know, a certain part of our memory of what a pandemic feels like or looks like. And I think it will continue to strengthen our position, maybe not for this situation in COVID, but hopefully in the future, uh, you know, the situations ahead. And, you know, just about two, three weeks ago, we already heard about another bird flu strain coming out of China, although not dangerous, as as so, you know, stated, we, we should start realizing that it's going to be something of the future. So I think that um, it actually is going to change our mentality, not just at the policy level, but actually at the consumer and the everyday people level. And I think that's going to have very interesting implications, not just in how we consume, but also how we perceive and also what is the next new wave right, of um, um, stealth wealth and how we're receiving all this information and therefore even people, even consumers becoming more conscious consumers as well. Um, so some really, really interesting things uh, on that front that we're asking ourselves from a pandemic to endemic um, scenario. Uh, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> well, definitely. Um, a new wave of stealth wealth. That's, a, that's an interesting uh, concept. Yeah, so, uh, I think one, one of the elements of, of our lifestyle brand has been always talking about, you know, how do we so, so we have basically three stages of, of, of life, right? I think we use uh, wealth in, early on as a materiality question, right? What could I have? What bags would I use and all that? And then we kind of evolve into an experiential element. How do I buy experiences? But actually mm -hmm. today, the real question that we have is the transformation economy. How do you actually make every purchase transformational for not just the user, 
but also the experience of actually being part of that journey, be part of your consumption, and therefore something that they really want more of. And I think that that's actually really interesting because you're starting to see normal cafes on the streets, whether in the U.S., outside California, asking questions about whether their, their, their cups are actually biodegradable, compostable. They're asking questions around, you know, um, are we actually not just having a transparent um, supply chain, but is it an impactful supply chain and mm-hmm. with, for the communities, especially after situations like Bangladesh? So I think that's really permeating in a time where people are also asking themselves what's important in life. And therefore, their consumption and the cons- conscious consumption will shift over time. So I think that that's um, the, the new stealth wealth or the, the new adoption of consumption that we're going to see shifting. Interesting. Yeah, you know, on that, on that note, in terms of consumption, I mean, I just came from Starbucks and uh, I've noticed lately there's no more, no more straws. Straws are not provided oh, yeah. you know, unless you ask specifically, but instead they have a nice, uh, you know, sipping uh, a special cup, special top for sipping. So um, that's that's progress. Well, um, you know, certainly open to other comments on that. On that note, um, we also have uh, a question that's come in from um, uh, from someone else in the harasses community here. From and I don't, uh, you know, necessarily want to keep the focus on Asia, but we happen to get a question from Asia that's a bit uh, Asia centric. So I might as well um, pose it. And this is from a gentleman, I believe, in Indonesia. Um, he said, and you had mentioned Indonesia in your in your remarks, Leon. He says, uh, "What do you think?" I'm paraphrasing a bit. What do you think would be a relevant and effective role model venture studio for emerging countries such as Indonesia, especially from seed to Series A in this post-COVID era? Well, wow, loaded question. My gosh, don't <laughs> don't ask me this question at four a.m. in the morning, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I, I think that there are, um, I think venture studios are going to see a, a, a bigger and bigger place in Asia, especially when we are also, as I mentioned before, a lot of brick and mortar conglomerates or companies are recognizing the importance of it and starting to realize how more disruptive they need to be in this space. I think a lot of the previous roles that we saw with venture studios um, partnering with say, uh, co- um, corporates or CVCs have been all about how do we absorb them into a, a, a normal system um, in you know brick and mortar nature. In actuality, the real question that they've um, I think many of them had the opportunity to ask but did not was you know how do we actually use that to disrupt the entirety of the bigger machine itself? And I think that's something that hasn't uh, been given the opportunity to merge the two elements together. And for emerging countries like Indonesia, where we see a huge dual speed of really, really, you know, uh, wonderful startup companies growing very quickly, like Gojek um, coming coming up versus, you know, very, very big companies itself, you know, trying to also manage themselves as it's it's coming through. You see companies like uh, Bluebird, for example, who is a taxi company, come to a situation where they realize they have a wonderful logistics network and hugely disrupted by COVID. And then they realize that, oh, well, we want to pivot and do something else or add on to the logistics network we have. And the last thing we, we're trying to build on is technology. And the th- that's the one thing that we need to be able to reinvent. And I, st- I think they're starting to realize all these different um, mergers and opportunities that they haven't been able to really tap on and they didn't think about until now. The other part in terms of just generic venture studio models is that actually it really captures uh, the whole new movement that's happening in the U.S. And impact investors, they call them the zebras, right? And those are not your unicorn explosive growth people but in actuality, they are slightly more stronger towards organic growth. And they're not your people, unicorn growth, where you're doing, you know, probably double valuations year on year, or even, you know, uh, like Sequoia likes, you know, your 20, 30% growth month on month. Um, but, you know, if you combine that and you think about a zebra as a 2x return kind of people, actually, I think um, there is a space that we haven't captured yet of people that actually sit within the 3x return to like the 10x return. And I call that like the flying f- flying zebras, right? Um, where they have a kind of organic growth, but yet they, they have still huge impact in the market. And venture studio models are allowing 
a, a stronger scaffolding for these types of growth for companies, which either, which happens to be a world where you either are unicorn like, and therefore we try to go after you or not at all. And therefore you don't fit within the VC space. And I think that we're starting to recognize that there's a really interesting return schedule for the space that v model venture studios can help in similar to what Eric and Bill mentioned um, before, or sorry, maybe Mike as well, that there is a interesting space where, um, oh, sorry, Mike definitely mentioned, you know, where um, there's all this different support that comes through in the venture studio model in, in the market, which is hugely uh, very dispersed um, and actually allowing that coalition um, of, you know, different uh, context networks to really consolidate within the venture studio model would make it very, very explosive, especially for these kind of flying <laughs> zebras as well in the space. So I think it's really interesting. And in a place like Indonesia, you, you, you don't have to win on being always a unicorn. If you sit somewhere in between in your return schedules, people are starting to realize that it's actually quite attractive. So the, the model of venture studio, especially when you can provide a lot of safety nets at the same time, will encourage more um, more entrepreneurs to come out and also take a, a different form of a growth path as well and not just a viral unicorn uh, growth path. So I think it's going to be an exciting time, especially where, you know, in Indonesia, you have one of the largest middle class uh, coming out uh, right now. Sorry, I, I know it took a lot of time, but um, some interesting, interesting things coming out from places like Indonesia, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks for that, Leon. Well, you know, uh, we've got... Uh uh, unicorns and flying zebras. You know, I, I didn't think this would be an interesting panel for me to tell my young kids about, but uh, <laughs> I'm just going to change my mind. I have to share it with them. Um, uh, Eric, you, uh, I, I believe you mentioned that your your investments are primarily in uh, U.S., Europe, and Israel. You may mention another region. I'd be curious to know if uh, if COVID has seen almost a, a reordering of um, of uh, of those markets, or if you're emphasizing you know, if, if some markets have become less dynamic versus others, and if you're emphasizing investments in some versus others more or less than you did before the pandemic. Yeah. So basically, you know, as you can imagine, in the tech business, uh, uh, India is a big worry now. India, which has been, uh, you know, at least until a few months ago, not not impacted too much by COVID. Uh, there were a lot of booming activities in India, and obviously everything is to mm -hmm. a note, you know. Uh, so India is a kind of a pretty pretty worrying now. But I would say, uh, uh, you know, being in Israel, being in a, uh, doing a lot of things in Japan, in Europe. So we've been, we've been a little bit all this COVID cycle, you know, doing a good of the country. For example, I was talking with my Japanese colleague yesterday where apparently you cannot travel, you cannot have meetings, but they are accepting uh, the athletes for the Olympic in Japan for the summer. You know? So I think we are in a world where, for me at least, uh, uh, a couple of lessons, you know, it's always the long term, the long -term trend. Or the, the lesson is that basically the the work a bit will change. The work from home mm -hmm. is not going to disappear. There will be obviously uh, for uh, white collar people, the work from home is going to to be there. I don't think people will do will go back 100 percent of the time to the office. It has a lot of implication in terms of uh, uh, you know obviously uh, uh, how you manage your people, also uh, payroll and uh, compensation policy because you can decide to live in a place which is less expensive than where office or the company is. What does it mean? Are you pay at the local level or are you pay, uh, you know, at the regional level? So the whole workforce management, compensation, motivation, how you manage people, what does training mean, is going to change. So uh, I see it's a kind of a wave. We just we are just at the beginning of it. But uh, we have to assume that at least in the work color space, the workforce is going to be fundamentally, fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. the, the other things also, uh, uh, what we see happening is the, you know, in the, in the kind of a, uh, supply chain is obviously uh, the short, uh, the short, the short supply chain are back. It's pretty obvious that in food, it's pretty obvious that in healthcare, we are not going to have potatoes, uh, you know, crossing half of the planet in a plane, you know, it's not going to be acceptable. Uh, mm -hmm. Before it was at least maybe economically acceptable, but it's not going to be there anymore. So the whole impact of this new uh, 
new way of building, producing, delivering. We are just at the beginning of it. And for me, if you just take the food and the, the health, let's say, the health care, uh, it's, it's enormous change happening, you know. Uh, you know, for me, this, this is happening. Yes, there will be more commerce. Yes, there will be more logistics. But this will be more incremental change. I think the workforce uh, management, the workforce training, education, compensation, uh, how you deliver and produce food, and what's happening in healthcare it is going to be a massive wave. You know, if you look at healthcare, we all got the habit to go to see the doctor or the nurse. I mean, COVID has told us that's the reverse. You could have a video with a doctor, at least in some country. All these things is going to change fundamentally, and I think that we are not going to see the real impact of that unless the next two or three years, but it's absolutely massive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Eric. Um, yeah, and you mentioned healthcare. We may, uh, that may be our, our last, maybe we can have a couple comments in the, on, on healthcare uh, before we wind this, uh, this discussion down. Um, Mike, you know, uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, if, if, if an investor talked with, met with a, a company that was working on um, vaccinations, um, it was a pretty boring discussion. You know, it was kind of a back, the backwater of life sciences. It was underfunded, uh, very little investor interest. Um, and that's certainly needless to say that's, uh, that that's changed a bit. I wonder if you, uh, uh, want to talk a little bit about, um, areas of life side that have become, uh, you know, more, more, uh, more intriguing, more dynamic from a, from a, you know, from an investor perspective in light of the pandemic. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to. And we used to joke in the industry that uh, nobody makes money in vaccines. And that was yeah. Yeah. the case for, <laughs> <you have> that? <laughs> yeah. and of course, last year, everything changed, uh, which yeah. you know, it used to be the case in the industry that if you wanted to start a new company, you had to spend you know, a million bucks, kind of like you know, 1990s internet companies. Uh, and then 2000 comes along, and of course, all this you know Web 2.0, 3.0 uh, type infrastructures in place. You now have that in biotech. So a small team of five people, you know, scientists, managers, etc., can be a core biotech company, and you can outsource basically everything else, including most of your actual research. You know your wet lab mm -hmm. work. So I, I think you're going to see an amazing renaissance of opportunity, which is only accelerated by the fact that people were working from home, and that particular model which I've been using for 15, 20 years, uh, just happened to be perfectly suited for the times. So um, it, in the broader life sciences space, you know, there's a lot of companies looking at ways to combine this massive computing infrastructure you know, with uh, these traditional drug development uh, devices, diagnostics, et cetera, and just you know, making use of that, um, you know, the, at least the engine that has been built uh, by uh, you know, Silicon Valley and others. And, uh, I think it's just going to be a fundamentally transformative period for, for the life sciences for the next 50 years. Of course, I'm placing a concentrated bet, to speak, in um, in regenerative medicine, looking to cure the big non-communicable diseases of our time. So I, I think the COVID vaccine being available within nine months from it being identified was the first of many miracles to come. Hmm. Oh, gosh, well, I don't think we could have uh, uh, concluded on a more optimistic note. Yeah, That's exactly. Good. That's great. Yeah. So, um, well, fortunately, uh, we're out of time, but uh, Eric, Mike, and Leon want to want to thank you all uh, most sincerely for uh, joining me here. Very much enjoyed the discussion, and uh, I, I, I hope others in the audience uh, did as well. Thank you in the audience for being with us as well, and uh, uh, thank you to, to Frank Jurgen-Richter, of course, for, uh, for making this event happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks, everybody. That concludes our discussion. Take care. Bye-bye.